Hi everyone, I'm on vacation or quite possibly being questioned by the FBI this week, so to make sure your thirst for Off Limits is quenched until episode 7, here's a recap of the best moments from the first 6 episodes. What was your favourite? Comment on the video below, I'll see you next week. After 20 long hard years at CNN, Jeffrey Tubin, whose most famous moment involved masturbating on a Zoom call, will be leaving the network in order to spend more quality time with his penis. Back in 2020, Jeffrey Tubin was yanked away from The New Yorker and placed on ice by CNN after exposing himself during a video conference call, showing us that it is important to know how to handle yourself properly in the workplace. What made this story even weirder was that Tubin had joined this particular Zoom call from his local bar. One woman took a liking to him when she arrived, asking, do you come here often? A spokesperson for CNN said at the time, Jeff Tubin has asked for some time off while he deals with a personal issue, which we have granted. 45 seconds later, Tubin said that he was refreshed and ready to knuckle down with some work. It was rumored that Jeffrey Tubin wanted to sue CNN for his suspension, but he was told that it would never stand up in court. Tubin was seriously a legal legend in the halls of CNN. When Chris Cuomo's career started to droop, he sought out Tubin for advice. It will be hard, Tubin told him, but you can beat it. Co-workers were reportedly delighted to hear that Tubin had been relieved of his duties, except for Jenny the intern who was tasked with clearing out his desk. People were also surprised to learn that it was a badly timed wank that ruined Jeffrey Tubin's career, and not the fact that he knocked up his co-worker's daughter and then pressured her to get an abortion. That actually happened, by the way. While CNN might be losing one of its most relentless legal minds, things are looking up for Jeffrey Tubin, after he launched his very own OnlyFans account. He's also working on a new book, which is a modern retelling of Moby Dick, although it won't be much of a page turner as all the pages will be stuck together. He had announced a sponsorship deal with Fitbit, but they backed out after the step-tracking wristbands they sent him kept exploding. To be fair to Jeffrey Tubin, the fastest hands in the East, there is one positive that's come out of all of this. Finally, we have proof that men can multitask. I'm Ian Howarth, and this is Off Limits. <laughs>
because nothing says grounded and humble, like a woman living off the notoriety of her pussy-whipped husband after isolating him from his relatives and living in a $14 million mansion in California while bitching about not being able to have an Instagram account after willingly marrying into the royal family before squeezing out a few kids that you celebrate as biracial despite them being whiter than me before the inevitable marriage collapse and public divorce leads to a multi-million dollar three-book deal, uncovering the truth about Prince Harry and his history of misogyny and abuse, after which she'll marry her third husband, who will help her continue pursuit of talentless fame, while also comparing yourself to a man who spent 27 years in prison in apartheid South Africa before uniting the country in the years that followed through a program of racial reconciliation. You think Nelson Mandela had it bad rotting in prison for decades. Meghan Markle couldn't even tweet for a few years. Now please, leave her alone. She just wants some privacy. And in case you missed it, WNBA star Brittany Griner has been given a nine-year prison sentence in Russia. Her only crime? Crime. President Joe Biden and Vice President Kamala Harris have been working around the clock between the hours of 3 p.m. and happy hour at Applebee's to free Griner with rumors of a potential prisoner swap that would somehow be the worst trade in WNBA history. After Biden and Harris openly fought for the freedom of an African-American in jail for having marijuana, 40,000 American citizens jailed in the U.S. for the same thing, many of whom are in jail because of Harris, released a joint statement which read, What the f***? And a Yankees fan went viral this week after being seen turning a hot dog into a beer straw. Never missing a chance to profit on the latest merchandise opportunity, the Yankees organization began brainstorming names for their new trademark drink. The latest frontrunners are Choking Hazard, Third Base, or the fan favorite, the Kamala Harris. Unfortunately for Yankee fans, none of these will be available in October. After growing bored of criticizing the MAGA movement, the Biden White House has started to get a bit more specific with its condemnation. Back in May, Biden warned against Ultra MAGA, which is like regular MAGA, except it's only 95 calories. And now things have deflated a bit after Biden referred to MAGA as a semi-fascist movement. Trump immediately responded to this insult by pounding Viagra, telling anyone who would listen that there's nothing worse than a semi as you're closing in on your goal. The New York Times pounced on the news, calling it the latest example of erection fraud from the former president. And prosecutors in Atlanta have announced that Rudy Giuliani, personal attorney to former President Donald Trump, is a target of their criminal investigation into so-called illegal attempts by Trump and others to interfere in the 2020 election. Fans of the legendary mayor of New York needn't worry though, the best legal minds in the country are in Rudy's corner, including Lionel Hutz from The Simpsons, Barry Zuckerkorn from Arrested Development, and Jenna Ellis from Real Life. Based on the feedback we've been getting, one thing is clear. Quite a lot of you would like nothing more than to sit on my face. While the vast, vast majority of you will never achieve that dream, I do have the next best thing. On watchofflimits.com shop, you can buy the official Off Limits with Ian Howarth pillow. It comes in a variety of sizes, depending on your needs, and is adorned with this face. And if you're into it, you can flip it over and enjoy the other side. And unlike my real face, this pillow is machine washable. Like my real face, it's 100% polyester. Do not rest until you buy your very own Off Limits with Ian Howarth pillow today. You might actually want to buy two, because you will need one to scream into for the next segment. Insider trading politicians, Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez, all politicians, the FBI, anti-Semitism, and speaking of Fauci, he really is just the worst. It reminds me of one of the cinematic masterpieces of our modern age, Mean Girls, where a group of teenagers called the Plastics spend every second of their day craving the adoration of everyone around them. When anyone points out that they're actually terrible human beings, the Plastics just say, you're obsessed. Why are you so obsessed with me? And this is the left's great trick. They elevate their heroes based on identity politics alone, like your group is a solid replacement for ability, pushing them as ideological and cultural superstars. The left now has overnight authority figures who can spit out talking points to their heart's content, all while using their identity categories as shields when they're inevitably criticized for their terrible ideas. How does the left respond? They go full mean girls. Every time you criticize one of their selected ideological heroes for being incompetent or corrupt or just plain evil, you're only doing so because you're obsessed with them. Why do you even care about this person we care so much about, they say. And AOC is the worst example of all. But they can't have it both ways. Either people are off limits because their skin color or religion or gender or sexual orientation, in which case stop using that as a substitute for competence, or everyone in public life is fair game for criticism, especially the ones on the top of the tree, especially people like AOC. But are we really honestly surprised that members of Congress, including Nancy Pelosi, who's Speaker of the House, who have made millions upon millions of dollars in the stock market, don't want to make it harder for them to gain the system? I'm pessimistic that the average person could reliably legislate their own behavior, let alone the swamp creatures in DC. 
I told you that pillow would come in handy. So if you haven't thrown your phone through a window by now, we should all be able to agree that the stock market should be off limits to the very people who are best positioned to manipulate and profit from it. But because we allow Congress to police itself, there's not much we can do right now. The House is working on legislation that might ban members of Congress, senior staff, and maybe their spouses from buying, selling, or trading individual stocks. But remember, Nancy Pelosi is Speaker of the House. This is the woman who thought the best way to prove she was just like the average citizen was to put on her favorite wig and call into the Late Late Show to show off her $24,000 freezer full of $12 a pint ice cream. If you think Nancy's going to take a pay cut because of a silly thing like corruption, you're higher than Joe Biden at a press conference. But there is a bright side. When the American dollar becomes worthless and China buys the country from under us, she will be just like us. Oh, except the Pelosi family has millions of dollars invested in China, so maybe not. Well, the fact is that the state of our politics is so cynical, so polarized, and so entrenched in virtue signaling that it doesn't really matter who is filling the seat itself. Every single issue is essentially split right down party lines, unless you ignore the handful of Republicans every year who think they can be the type of conservatives the Democrats respect. It really doesn't matter whether the person casting that vote is alive or dead, or somewhere in the middle, if they're going to vote the same way regardless. This situation has gotten so bad that it's been a years-long national news story that two Democratic senators sometimes refuse to toe the party line. And like a compliant, barely alive president of the United States, a compliant voting group in Congress is good for the powers in the shadows behind these government figures. While younger and more ambitious politicians might be tempted to try and actually do something different, even if their ideas are disastrously dumb, the reality is that they'll just be a nuisance to those protecting the status quo. A freshman senator might have to be bullied into supporting the latest spending bill. That takes effort. And money. Instead, why not just keep Diane Feinstein on life support so she can send billions of dollars to Ukraine or into the ether of the federal government and let her get back to the same crossword she's been stuck on since 2008? So, what's the solution here? Run for office? <laughs> I don't think so. Implement term limits? Maybe. Hold a super spreader event on the White House lawn and let nature take its course? How dare you? But while our current class of aging politicians somehow keep running on a steady stream of vodka and Adderall, this is a problem that's not going away especially as their baby boomer sidekicks catch up with them. And before anyone misunderstands what I'm saying, this isn't a call in support of 26-year-olds running for office who don't know anything and have never done anything who see Congress as a way of boosting their social media presence. And it's not like I'm saying Congress should be off limits to anyone older than 50. What I am saying is surely, surely we can find someone between the ages of birth and edge of death who are at least slightly competent. Then again, maybe not. Two days after the Stoneman Douglas high school shooting in 2018, the FBI admitted that they have received a tip-off one month beforehand. The caller provided information about the shooter's gun ownership, desire to kill people, erratic behavior, and disturbing social media posts, as well as the potential of him conducting a school shooting. They did nothing about it, and later reported that protocol was not followed when the tip was not forwarded to the Miami field office. 17 people were killed by the shooter. And in 2015, a white supremacist committed a mass shooting at the Emanuel AME Church in Charleston, South Carolina, despite the fact that he shouldn't have been able to buy a firearm legally, having confessed to possessing narcotics. But the FBI didn't reject the background check because they screwed up the individual's information and confused two different police departments. So the shooter was able to buy a firearm and murdered nine people. And in one case, the FBI looked into someone who wrote on a message board that he was, quote, plotting a mass shooting and looking for, quote, weapons that are good for killing a lot of people within a budget. He then told the agents that he's, quote, not the type to actually do any of this stuff, and they agreed and closed the case. They also didn't inform the school. The next year, that person committed a school shooting, killing two students and then himself. And the history of the FBI is as bloody as it is incompetent. First, there's what the Department of Justice called possibly the worst intelligence disaster in US history when Special Agent Robert Hansen was arrested for spying for the Soviet Union and then Russia for over 20 years. In another example, when the FBI raided the home of a political activist in 2010, they left the confidential government operations order behind, which included plans for the raid, photographs, and potential interview questions, and didn't even realize what they'd done until the documents were posted online. In 2008, the FBI had their phone line cut during a national security investigation because they forgot to pay the bill. And if you have a face, maybe you should be worried that the FBI might use it for a wanted poster if they really need a good photo. When the FBI were trying to catch Whitey Bulger after he fled, they used the photographs of a random retired couple who suddenly became the center of an international manhunt. 
This also happened to a Spanish politician when the FBI used a bunch of his facial features to build what they thought an up-to-date image of Osama bin Laden would look like. And finally, there are cases that are just plain weird. There's a time an FBI agent impersonated a journalist from the Associated Press and unintentionally infected a 15-year-old suspect's computer with malicious surveillance software. A Caltech graduate student found that FBI computers were used to edit the FBI article on Wikipedia. There's the story when a would-be school bomber noticed before his arrest that a nearby wireless connection popped up as FBI surveillance van. There's an undercover FBI agent who admitted to using a video camera that didn't record audio and didn't catch visual evidence of an alleged murder plot. Another FBI agent crashed a top-of-the-line Ferrari F50 into a bush, and he refused to pay $750,000 in damages after being instructed to move the vehicle, which was still involved in an investigation. There's also a time the FBI were investigating video of an apparent murder scene, which turned out to be footage of the band Nine Inch Nails filming a music video. And then there's the FBI agent who fell in love with the person she was investigating. Oh, and that person was a German rapper turned ISIS terrorist. Yeah, in 2014, the agent fell in love with Dennis Cuspert, whose rap name was Dezo Dog, and terrorist name was Abu Talha al-Armani. She left her husband to marry Abu, fleeing to Syria before fleeing back to the US when she realized that being married to a man who held a freshly severed head in a propaganda video for ISIS wasn't the romantic fairy tale she was promised. To be fair, Abu did ask her to fly to Syria for some head. Time after time, the FBI screws up. And I'm not even mentioning the multiple high-profile calamities in recent years, like the FBI's failure to act on allegations made by US gymnasts against former team doctor Larry Nasser, or taking orders from a fraudster who is stealing from a crime scene, or butt-dialing a serial killer, tipping him off and setting him free, or spending two years investigating an anti-goth cult, which was actually a satire website. So when the FBI is built on a rotten foundation and populated by the kind of geniuses who name their Wi-Fi FBI surveillance van, is it really any surprise that the agency is so easily abused? Are you really surprised that the FBI would be used to target political enemies, given that's what they've been doing from the start? Are you really surprised that the FBI would be used to mislabel law-abiding American citizens as domestic terrorists to justify censorship, or worse, given that's what they'd be doing from the start? Are you really surprised that the FBI routinely fails in its fundamental responsibilities to protect law-abiding American citizens from actual crime, given that's what they'd be doing from the start? If you still think the FBI is a force for good at this point, you're either stupid or you're in the FBI. But I repeat myself, because they want you to watch this documentary and come away with the following conclusion, that anti-Semitism is a violent problem on the extreme right with some comparatively minor bubbling issues on the left when it comes to Israel, which are excused or explained away by legitimate concerns about Palestinian human rights. But that's a lie. Anti-Semitism is a violent problem on the extreme right and the extreme left, enabled by passive anti-Semitism on the right, left, and the middle. The fight against anti-Semitism is really important to me. It's something I face for most of my life, and as a conservative Jew in the US, it's crucial that I call out anti-Semitism when I see it on both sides, because I actually want to fight anti-Semitism. That's why I don't make excuses for anyone who pushes anti-Semitic tropes, regardless of whether they're on my side or not, because fighting anti-Semitism matters more to me than elevating a Republican or denigrating a Democrat based on some other political narrative because anti-Semitism is an equal opportunities form of bigotry. If you're a Jewish person being abused online or attacked in the streets of New York or murdered in your business or synagogue, does it matter who your attacker voted for? Until we can speak honestly about all anti-Semitism in America, how can we expect it to change? And how can we expect it to change until people care more about protecting Jews than protecting votes? As his ego grew, he even announced that he was no longer a scientist but the science. So it's easy to criticize, but they're really criticizing science. And why? Well, it's because Fauci is a scientist second and a politician first. Yes, he's a public servant, but he's a public servant who serves himself before anyone or anything else. No one can survive for 30 seconds in DC without knowing how to play the game. You think Fauci survived decades and became a multimillionaire because he's not good at playing politics. And COVID-19 is all the proof we need. Is it a coincidence that Fauci partnered with Deborah Birx and Robert Redfield following the failed AIDS vaccine project to exploit a relationship that lasted for years, agreeing to resign if one of them was fired and promising to never disagree with each other publicly, such as refusing to acknowledge evidence that lockdowns and mask mandates weren't working? All while his objective changed depending on who was in office. Under Trump, he knew that his role was to simultaneously combat COVID-19 and the Republican administration. 
Under Biden, his role changed to helping the Democrat administration move on. And the mainstream media, who were part of this institutional apparatus, helped at every step along the way. Regardless of whether masks worked or didn't work, or whether any of the science changed, his constant politically helpful flip-flopping created and fueled mistrust and confusion, made worse by his arrogant sneering at the legitimate questions of frustrated American citizens whose lives were being ruined by his nonsense. But moving the goalposts was part of Fauci's entire strategy to keep himself in a position of supposed authority, saying that he changed his public viewpoint based on, quote, his gut feeling that the country is finally ready to hear what he really thinks. They think you're stupid. That's the takeaway here. They know what's best for you, even if you can't see it. And it just so happens that what's best for you is also what's best for them. How convenient. The reason Fauci is the worst is because he's indicative of everything that is wrong with our expert class. It's not about science or truth or understanding, but power. Our expert class is no longer populated by actual experts because they are still largely driven by the pursuit of truth. And in today's society, truth is a bad word. Instead, our experts are politicians in lab coats, people who would blow their nose on the truth if it meant more power or more money or more influence. And Fauci is the worst of them all. Thanks for joining me. Please don't forget to hit that like button, the notifications bell, subscribe to the channel for other videos, follow me on all social media. I'll see you next time on Off Limits with me, Ian Howarth.